Hi, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine yesterday and I was saying to her that the United States is a dying country. It's a dying country because its educational systems, its political systems, and its cultural systems, or its cultural conduits, are no longer worthy of being emulated. If you're an empire, the whole idea is not to go overseas and put other countries in debt by force, but it's to project influence. And the way you project influence honorably is, well, there's a couple of ways, and, you know, at least two ways. One of them is, is what happened with colonialism. You go overseas and then you, you justify your theft of the other country's resources, you know, not by the proper philosophy of, you know, might makes right, or I should say the accurate philosophy. You justify it through racism. You, just, you justify it through your own perceived superiority. You justify it through a lot of things, everything but the truth, which is that you're there illegally, immorally, and in, in order to project influence, you have to present a story that essentially covers up why you're there. Because you can't go somewhere and say, I'm here because I want cheap labor. I'm here because I want to take your natural resources. And I'm, I'm able to do these things because I happen to have either a stronger military or a stronger currency. And of course, these two things go together, the strong military and the strong currency, because you can't have a strong currency without being able to enforce judgments, without being able to enforce contracts. And we can sort of go back and forth about what makes an empire, but fundamentally what makes an empire is the ability to go to a foreign destination and project your culture, your educational systems, and your political systems under the assumption that all, all the above are superior to the existing informal system. And in some cases, you can see how capitalism, you know, can be described as progress in developing countries. If you go somewhere that has no development and within five to 10 years has a shopping mall and of course roads, that have to allow you to get to the shopping mall, which of course require cars, which required or required gasoline. And suddenly you have an entire economic structure that counts as economic progress. Now, of course, this leads to inequality because you can't change a country overnight. You can't go from developing to developed overnight. But what I really wanna talk about is the United States, which is where I am right now. And my concern is that for future historians, they're going to study this country and, and go off the wrong, go on the wrong path. And what is, is crucial is, is a bit like science, right? You, you want to sort of cut off through experimentation, you want to cut off the false avenues so that future generations can at least narrow the potential answers, the potential paths to answers. And that's really what progress is. It's, this, it's incremental knowledge that is passed down from generation to generation that is supposed to create a better future. We call that institutional knowledge. And so the culture is really this idea that you transfer institutional knowledge to the next generation and there's progress as a result. What has happened in the United States is this idea of, of course, fake news, uh, concentration of ownership, concentration of property ownership, and so on and so forth. And this has devolved into a discussion about capitalism, capitalism versus communism, uh, which partly led to the Vietnam War in the past. Um, it's sometimes referred to as a discussion between capitalism and socialism. And what the first thing you have to understand is that socialism and communism did not necessarily project themselves as a, an independent economic system. They tried, but fundamentally what was driving communism and capitalism was this idea that there is a system somewhere that is opposed to the Western system that creates less inequality and less racism and less sexism.
And it's hard to believe now in 2020, uh, but the United States was extremely sexist uh, and then just about 60, 60 years ago. Um, you had, you know, jobs that were cut off to women and so on and so forth. With the racism, it's a little bit more obvious because there were laws that were passed called Jim Crow. There were Supreme Court decisions that were passed. With the women's rights movement, a lot of it's been, you know, a lot of it's been based on wages and pay. Even recently, you've got a Supreme Court decision when, um, that refers to, you know, lack of equal pay over time. You've got something called the Equal Pay Amendment, Equal Rights Amendment, Equal Pay Amendment. All these things have been discussed over time. But it's a little harder to, to, to sort of reach back on that issue of sexism simply because it's not as obvious. It's a little bit obvious when you open up an old magazine and you see the advertisements that are geared towards women, um, all of which involves cooking or some very superficial you know, fashion uh, advertisement, cleaning, so on and so forth, which is a reflection of how few career opportunities there were for women back in the day in the United States. And again, this is not 100 years ago. This is 60 years ago. Uh, one of the famous anecdotes is that Sandra Day O'Connor graduated, I think, top of her class at Stanford Law School and was unable to find a job as a lawyer. So, and of course, she eventually became a Supreme Court justice. That's progress. But in dealing with these social issues, these are actually issues that were put to the vanguard by communism and socialism because they looked upon the West 60 years ago as sexist and racist, and justifiably so. If you go back and look at the advertisements, the idea is that the communists and the socialists would counter the West and the Western decadence by propagating the very values that the United States or the West presumes to have today in the year 2020. And it's able, that's, that's, that shift has happened um, because of economics. It turns out that you can have all the good intentions in the world, but if you don't have a way of paying your workers, if you don't have, if you don't have a way of attracting the best talent, all of your intentions regarding social issues become secondary. And in fact, uh, are almost considered superfluous. And this is, again, a country that, you know, both Canada and the United States that interned Japanese uh, Canadians and Japanese Americans on just suspicion. And so it's not as if the legal system was at, you know, at, at most cases of stress, protective of minority rights. We know that's not the case just by looking at the court systems and at the court decisions. So we know that path one, that what communism and socialism purported to bring to the table failed because the economic philosophy was underdeveloped, but it was extremely attractive because of its opposition to the West 60 years ago uh, and the culture of the West 60 years ago. There's a really interesting writer called, a uh, Canadian, called Dan, Dan Wang, W-A-N-G. And he just came, he, every year he issues an end of the year report and he actually touches upon quite a few of these issues. But for, for our purposes today, what I'm trying to discuss is that rather than focusing on these social issues, what we should have been doing in the, in the US was focusing on concentration of ownership and a lot of the other issues that the communists, that led to the communist revolution. Essentially, a peasant-based revolution against landlords. And this is what's happening in some cases in the US. Now, it turns out that when people go back and study this pandemic, they're going to say that this was an extremely difficult crisis and it, it reshaped the world. It may have reshaped supply chains but it hasn't, it hasn't led to any sort of cultural upheaval, despite what people may think in the future. What is, and I'll, I'll give you an example of why, um, of, of, of why that's the case. The housing, you know, there's, there's a, an economic metric called, you know, housing mortgage delinquencies. 
and it's, it's based on payments that are overdue by 30 days or uh, over 90 days. And before the pandemic, let's, let's just go back to, to December of 2019, months before the pandemic, actually right around the time that, right before the time that the virus, the coronavirus was uh, probably making its way through China. The delinquency rate on a 30 day you know, sort of mortgage uh, on the payments for the 30 day mortgage was 2.2% in the US. Fast forward to this pandemic where you have a shutdown of major economies, you have trillions of dollars of economic activity being shut down. And the, the delinquency rate on the same metric has gone down to point, either 0.8 or 0.6. Let that sink in for a moment. That Remember that the idea behind communism was communal ownership, was property ownership, was trying to take power away from the landlords and give it back to the people. And not just, you know, white men, but you know, everyone in society. And that's why it was so attractive, because it, it wanted to have a big tent. And at the time, that tent was not as inclusive in the West. And of course, the West learned and adapted and was able to, as a result, uh, beat the communist philosophy back then, which culminated in the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. But fast forward to today, and you now have, despite the fact that you have home ownership at almost all-time highs, it's always been between, well, it's not always, but for the most part, because of debt and lower interest rates, over the last 20 years, home ownership rates have remained fairly steady or, um, or even increased from about 65% to 70, uh, about 71 or, or so on percent. Let's just say 60 to 75%, which is a fairly high number. Um, and among the um, among people that were not uh, uh, subject to slavery and property restrictions in the U.S., that number is actually 75%. Uh, so only about 25% within that category do not own a home. Uh, among people that were subject to slavery in the past, uh, which is really one of the biggest complaints about you know that communism was focusing on, um, among that group it's, it's about it's about 50%. So there's been progress, but you know, not, not necessarily, uh, but there's still inequality, which is something that, that the capitalist system recognizes. But sitting here or standing here today and trying to create a record for future generations, they're going to look at these numbers and they're going to focus on the wrong things. They're going to say the pandemic happened. It, it created a new world order. Uh, or they might look back on these numbers that I just described, including the fact that the stock market is at an all-time high in the U.S., and they're going, to go and they're going to look at that, and it's not going to make any sense. Because we are now in a position in the U.S. where it's not as if people are suddenly richer as a result of a year of economic, of a, of a reduction in economic and social activity. What's really happened is people have taken on more debt, and it's become easier to get debt. It's become, you know, prices have come down. For a lot of items because when you have a global economic shutdown those goods have to be shipped out you know you can't you know they're suddenly they suddenly become undesirable because most places don't have the warehousing ca capacity to keep them so i was just you know online last week i was able to buy a t-shirt a nice one for two dollars from a major retailer that was retailing at a store in a shopping mall for 25 dollars that would have been last year so some things have come down, uh, some other things have not, uh, and something as basic as rubbing alcohol, uh, which used to be a dollar and a half for 16 ounces, is now $6, depending on where you look, online. But the fact of the matter is overall, because the supply chains uh, have improved greatly, uh, which is not coincidental, it's, it's uh, a, a situation where satellite power and satellite accuracy has, has increased dramatically uh, this year, uh, sorry, last year in 2020. It's now 2021 in January. So all these things are coming together and they're creating a concentration of, of ownership. They're solidifying the previous concentration of ownership of real property and of you know a lot of the other issues that were problems in China that were problems in Vietnam and so on and so forth. 
And one of the one of the acute problems we have is that there are now parallel structures. Now, Vaclav Havel, the Czech dissident, one of my heroes, he talked about the fact that when you're living under an unjust system, political system, one way that you can fight back is by creating a parallel structure. In other words, if the system says you can't have this, what you do is you create a parallel structure that is often informal, and over time, that informal structure, that informal chain, leads to social change. We're finding out that that's not necessarily, that was too optimistic, because again, if, you're, if your competitor is a dictatorship that has access to surveillance technology, that has, has, has access to, to satellite imagery, has access to GPS, and you don't, the only parallel structures you can create are going to be infinitesimal in scope and unable to be projected. Which is, again, the idea behind all inventions. You want to create something that replaces what came before, hopefully without excessive social upheaval, and in doing so, over time, project it and create a single standard that is secure, whether it's technological or something else. And in, in the United States, the reason, one of the reasons this feels like a dead country already is not only because of the excessive debt, but this, this idea that despite all the numbers, you still have a misplacement of priorities. So remember that, you know, in response to, you know, the, the communist focused on minority rights and peace was in response to Vietnamese, the, the American war of aggression against Vietnam. It was in response to, uh, you know, Jim Crow in the U.S. And these were very obvious sorts of, you know, problems that the communists focused on to project the idea that their system was a superior system socially. And so the United States responded, responded over time to that. And like I said, there's, there are still major gaps, but not as much as, as we had in the past. But the problem is that by focusing on these issues, and now, now we're focusing on demographics. So we, we had, a, we had a, a, a time period where we were concerned about demographics. We were saying that people were having fewer children, and therefore, you know, we, were having, we would have a crisis at some point. And this is not a small issue. China had a problem with too many people, and so had a one-child policy uh, in, in the past. Now, wh what you realize uh, is that the, these systems, at least in the West, the West responded accurately to the challenge of communism and socialism from the East with respect to social issues. It, you know, you couldn't, it could not, under the JFK administration, under the, under the RFK administration, it could not continue to have an image of a great power associated with fire hosing minorities in the streets that were peacefully protesting. And so it, it, it fixed that for the most part. We still have massive seg segregation today uh, that, is a, that, that is what you call an overhang from prior policies. But certainly not to the degree that existed 60 years ago. So that's progress. But my concern is that by focusing on demographics, which is not a problem unique to the, to the US, we are now sort of back to, a, to, an, to an earlier time when we're back into issues of, of political concentration um, of power, we're back to real, real estate property concentration of power, and we're back to stock market concentration of power. And we don't necessarily have any answers for these other than more and more debt. And in order to have that, we have to put the whole world in debt because we have a single standard that we've you know, projected across the whole world. Uh, that is dependent on maintaining that standard in order to maintain the cash flow back to the empire, back to the U.S. And it's becoming harder for us to take up the mantle of equality because our political class in the U.S. has become solidly concentrated as a third Catholic church empire. So remember, the Catholic church sort of failed with, a, with the Roman Empire uh, right around Italy. It had to go to Germany in the Saxony area, 
Uh, that's where you had the Protestant Reformation, as you know, with Martin Luther that was successful. There were other Protestant Reformations that were successful, that were unsuccessful, uh, but that was the one in Germany that was successful. Unfortunately, Martin Luther was anti-Semitic, uh, and this, you know that had consequences and probably had consequences in the future uh, for Germany. Uh, and so you have to remember that the Protestants were protesting the Catholic Church, and, and almost all the religions within Christianity are offshoots uh, as a result of the uh, intolerance of the European-based Catholic Church. And so we come here today, and to give you an example of, of how much progress has been made, uh, you know, the Catholic Church was banned in New York. Uh, none of the founders of the United States were Catholic. Um, and, you know, today... You know, in, in contrast, we have an uh, incoming president who is Catholic. In my city of San Jose, the police chief is Catholic. Um, the supervising presiding judge is Catholic at the courthouse. Um, you know, the mayor went to a private Catholic school. When he became mayor, he ran against another, uh, actually someone who was a classmate, uh, who went from the same, not, not, maybe not, a, not from the same four years, uh, but from the same private Catholic school. And so we go back to this idea of a parallel structure that was in a reaction to discrimination, that was in a reaction to the assumption by the Protestants who were fleeing Europe to come to the United States because of Catholic intolerance. And in order to prevent a, a replication of that intolerance, were intolerant and banned the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church set up these parallel structures because eventually, after the Protestant Reformation, it got kicked out of Europe. And so it came to the United States, the, the, the New World. And suddenly you have these, these, these parallel structures over time. Uh, the United States Supreme Court uh, has a majority Catholic, uh, you know, um, but it's just majority Catholic. So these parallel structures worked. Um, and now we're in a position where they may have worked too well. And so when you study the United States, you have to look at it from this idea of history being a culmination of oppositional movements. And what has really happened is that when you're, when you're in the crucible, what tends to happen is that you become more concentrated, you know, intellectually and socially and economically than your competition because you have to be. And, you know, while your competition in the existing status quo is getting fat and happy uh, and content, because you're trying to work this parallel structure in response to intolerance or simply being excluded uh, you know, in, informally, you know, you have a sharper edge. And this is what's happening in China. China is creating a, a, a competing system to the, to, the, to the U.S. The U.S. is naval-based system. It's creating a belt, you know, a, a, essentially a new Stoke Road. It's really based, uh, it's designed to uh, move away from U.S. naval supremacy. And it was, in fact, naval supremacy in Europe that created the rise of Western civilization from 1511 all the way up until 2001, uh, when the Portuguese went in and took over the Straits of Malacca. Um, and you have to remember, the Portuguese never really had an empire. They were a colonial empire, but simply having naval rights, simply having a good supply chain does not guarantee an empire. Portugal today is one, is, is, I'm not going to say it's a poor country, but it's not necessarily a country uh, that is able to project any sort of influence apart from being part of the EU and having a port. So you put all these things together and you realize that the future belongs to China uh, because it is now being excluded uh, using legal sanctions and so on uh, with Huawei, with, you know, you know, in order to maintain the United States' dominance uh, of the technology sector. And my fear is that this is going to create uh, a, a, an invisible revolution where you now have invisible digital walls and so far, that's not been the case. You've had companies like Alibaba and Amazon that have used their, their outsized growth and their outsized power to prevent a political, uh, po political stymieing or block of economic globalism. The question is, how long is that going to continue? Because once again, we know that concentration of ownership is not a good thing. Um, we know that the United States... Is, is maintaining its empire based on low interest rates um, and essentially a parallel structure that still exists to this day. There are so many private schools in this area. 
uh, it's, you know, essentially if you put your kid in a private Catholic school now in this area, what you're really doing is you're, cre you're putting a down payment on a government job in the future for your child. This is not a structure that leads to a, mer you know, a merit-based society. But it's a parallel structure that was necessary in the past because of discrimination against the Catholic Church. So here we are, and you really have to, one of the things you have to look at, think about when you study this country and its decline is how badly the Protestants have done in this country. Remember, they protested the Catholics in Europe, and that's why they came here. And when they came here, the idea was that they probably focused on the economic sector. And today, there is great diversity within the economic sector. Um, you know, Google is led by somebody, I believe, who was born in India. Uh, Microsoft is led by a brilliant CEO, uh, Nadella, who I, I, is of Indian, uh, of Eastern Indian descent. So you have some diversity, but what you're really noticing is that that diversity is tied to an economic framework uh, where we are trying to project capitalism and our systems onto a billion new potential consumers in India because we've sort of given up on, you know, on China. And so you notice you don't have that many, if at all, you know, major Chinese CEOs here in the U.S., you have you know, to the extent they're of they look Chinese, they're either probably Taiwanese. Uh, for Nvidia, a chip maker, um, again, has a Taiwanese American, you know, or had a Taiwanese American CEO. Uh, it could be Vietnamese. So you start to realize that that you're dealing with a society that is in danger of becoming a replica of the old systems that led to a revolution. Uh, and the question is right now, you know, that's been pushed out to the, to, to the, to the future because of low interest rates and, you know, increasing, increases in, in property ownership. Uh, like I said, property ownership and, and property housing prices have gone up, residential, have gone up, you know, dramatically despite the pandemic. So that, that, is, that is not an accident. That is a, a, a result of cheap money from the central bank. Uh, and a concentrated, you know, philosophy of lower interest rates, you know, specifically in the mortgage sector. Now, remember, we had the same problem in 2008 and 2009, and it led to a crash in housing prices. I don't think that's going to happen now, uh, anytime soon, you know, because, like I said, the, the idea with, with demographics is that, you know, we've been focusing on, on demographics, which we really shouldn't have been. Uh, not in the West, because you can fix that with immigration. The, the question really is, you know, how do you get the best immigrants? That's a separate question, but demographics, if you're studying the, 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 the decline of empires, you have to realize that if you are an empire, you have to have immigration. So demographics is not necessarily an issue. The real issue is attracting the best immigrants. And even we have this idea of, of cultural assimilation. Even that's not a significant issue. It, it used to be, and I used to think it was. It's really not. The real issue is when you have these immigrants coming in to replace or sort of moderate the demographic mix, the question is how do you create a system where the demographics are represented in a, merit, in a meritocracy or, or a merit-based way within your political structure, within your educational structure, and within your media, aka your media, uh, your cultural uh, conduits. That's something we haven't really solved here in the U.S., and that's pretty obvious. Um, you know, 2019 was the year of Black Lives Matter. Uh, once again, so we're sort of repeating the mistakes of the past we could, because we have, we've never fixed them. And, you know, so when you're studying the United States, you have to realize that even with China's one-child policy, demographics is really not the primary issue and should not be the primary issue. Uh, even cultural assimilation should not be the primary issue. The primary issue should be whether or not you have a system educationally, uh, you know, based on you know, your, your journalism sector, which is really now a video media, media sector. Um, and you're, and you know, all these things have to be representative in a meritocracy, in, in, in a merit-based manner so that you don't end up creating, solidifying, Segregation. You're going to have segregation. That's how that's how things work. Uh, Malcolm X talked about that. He said that you know birds of birds of a feather flock together, and you know that's not necessarily true. Uh, it takes work to make sure that doesn't happen. And of course, when Malcolm X went to Mecca, 
um, he, he realized that you know, he was only looking at an American-based philosophy, which was his own limited view, which was also justified because of, his, of the way he grew up in the U.S. at the time. So you start to realize these cultural conduits include religion, which is not taxed in the U.S., thereby creating a, an increased tax burden on other institutions. Educational systems are not taxed. Colleges are not taxed. They have billions of dollars in endowments. They're not taxed. So you have to have a system that really focuses on a merit-based inclusion um, philosophy. And how do you do that? It used to be that you went to college and the colleges did, did all this for you. But as prices went up for college, that's no longer the case. Uh, and it's becoming, again, just like what happened in the past where you had these communist revolutions against the elite. The elite, you know, were, you know, out of touch. So you, you had the segregation that was, you know, that solidified using political structures. And so one of the ideas is when Malcolm X went to Mecca, he said that, right, well, religion, he, he sort of realized that religion, you know, does not have to be, does not have to promote segregation. It can be anti-segregation, but it has to be a, a it has to be, you know, a system that works. And how do you make that system work? That's the issue. So it's not demographics, it's culture. And, you know, I used to be really interested in law and politics, and now it's, I'm, I'm more interested in sociology and history. Because you start to see these patterns being repeated over and over again. And you start to realize that, you know, we're, if you're focusing on the wrong thing, you're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to keep repeating the same mistakes, which is, which is what we're doing in the U.S. And where, where do we go from here? Again, if, you're, if your empire is based on, you know, having a single standard of, of technology that is dominant, uh, but that requires you to block a competing technology from, an, from another country, you know, it, it's not something that's going to succeed long term. It's something that's very precarious. And when you combine that with China's, you know, system of China's revisioning of the supply chain, you know, you start to realize that, you know, we are in danger not only of local segregation, we're in danger of global segregation that is a result of not fixing all of these issues that we should have fixed, um, you know, many years ago, especially since 1991. And we just haven't done it. So all the countries that we were competing against since 1981 have been reshaping themselves, have realized, have learned from the West, um, and have reshaped their e economic systems and their banking systems. But we're still in the same boom-bust cycles that Karl Marx, you know, complained about, which tells you we haven't really gotten anywhere, which tells you that the problem really co continues to be culture, continues to be, you know, mistranslations, continues to be... Uh, a failure of diplomacy, international diplomacy, even in the, in, which has consequences, you know. Even in, in the U.S., we have a failure of, di of domestic diplomacy. So you see all these intangible cultural, you know, uh, issues continuing to sort of call, cry out for help and cry out for attention. And it's hard to address all that when you, when you have this global system that's based on, you know, cheap money and cheap debt that permeates itself creating the vision or the image of wealth that's really based on debt, which is really based on a banking system, which is then based on concentration of ownership and, and superior security, which then makes it a little bit easier to tolerate this idea of might makes right, which is something that we were supposed to be far, far away from at this point in time in our human cultural evolution.